Welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Oxley, and I'm the Writing Across Media Facilitator at Vermont Studio Center. If you're not familiar with VSC, a little bit about us. We are located in Northern Vermont in the town of Johnson, and we are an international residency program for visual artists and writers. Our beautiful campus is bisected by the Gihon River, and this time of year, um, we're towards the end of peak fall foliage. So a lot of the leaves have fallen off, but there's still, still some beautiful color happening. Um, and I wanna take a moment to recognize that we operate on land that has long served as a site of media exchange for indigenous people for thousands of years. And um, where we are located, um, we are located on the unceded territory of the Abenaki people. We honor, recognize, and respect these peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and waters on which we gather. It is such a pleasure to be here with you all tonight. Tori is going to read for us, um, and then there will be a, a question session with Naomi Gordon Robel, and then we'll um, take some questions from the chat. So everything will be moderated from the chat. Thank you again for being here. Um, I'm going to introduce both of our writers tonight and then turn it over to Tori to read. Tori Peters is the author of the best-selling novel, Detransition Baby, which was longlisted for the Women's Prize and was a Roxanne Gay's audacious book club pick. She is also the author of the novellas Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones and The Masker. Tori holds an MFA from the University of Iowa and a master's in comparative literature from Dartmouth. She splits her time between Brooklyn and an off-grid cabin in Vermont. And um, in conversation with her tonight is Naomi Gordon Lobel, who is a writer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Harper's Complex, Out, The Nation, and elsewhere. Formerly, she was the research editor and internship director at The Nation magazine. She is the recipient of residencies and fellowships from the Puffin Foundation, Lambda Literary, Munson Arts, the studios at Key West, and the Vermont Studio Center, where I had the pleasure of meeting Naomi for the first time. Before working in journalism, she spent five years as a teacher and youth development professional, helping people who had left school to include their high school equivalency diplomas. Naomi was born, raised, and lives in Brooklyn, but she is currently in St. Louis completing her MFA. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. It is a deep pleasure. I loved your book, Tori, and I can't wait to hear you read. And I just wanna let you all know that she also says she's gonna read a little bit of new work as well. So we'll get a little bit of detransition baby and as well as New York, uh, new work. Tori, the floor is yours. Hi, um, I'm really thrilled to be here. I do spend a lot of time in Vermont. So saying this is, uh, it feels like a quasi home state event. And um, yeah, I'm just, I was so happy to when, when I got the invitation. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna start off by just reading um, from the book. This is a British version, which is why it doesn't look like yours if you have one. Uh, and uh, um, this, this section, um, it doesn't need too much setup, uh, basically, uh, Reese is at a bar and she's, the, the book talks a lot about different ways of being a mother. And this is um, Reese being a mother in a sort of trans motherhood sort of way rather than perhaps biological motherhood. <clears throat> okay, uh, oops, one page back. Uh, here we go. On a last minute whim, Reese decided to go see her friend Talia's weekly set at Dynamite, one of several North Brooklyn queer dive bars run by the same shady family of straight people. Talia was a former drag queen turned transsexual, one of the earliest converts in the great drag enlightenment, when a significant quorum of Brooklyn's queens came out as trans, began to inject estrogen, and renounced their gay past, the consequences of which miffed them into misandry as the desperately cute twinks who used to sleep with them no longer would. Talia runs a set called Anger Management in which she plays tropical dubstep to keep everyone chill, then undercuts her chill vibes with hourly advice sessions in which she solicits Ann Lander style questions 
from the various twinks who form her now sexually unavailable fan base, then berates them for their stupidity in profound and profane harangues. It was reliably the most entertaining way for Reese to spend a Tuesday night. <clears throat> Tonight, one of the twinks asks about sharing chores in a relationship. The twink has found that in his relationship with a masked dom, he is doing much more household work. So can he employ feminist arguments for a more equitable share in the domestic labor? To which Talia responds that no, he is a little bitch. And in the midst of a shortage of actual true to God dom tops, he had best start scrubbing if he wants to keep his man happy. However, Talia adds, the whole premise of the question ought to be rejected because there's no such thing as a pure mass top. Everyone will eventually want to have want something in their butt because that is the nature of having a butt. When the moment comes that things get equitable in bed, so should they be in domestic labor. The twinks giggle happily, but Talia rebukes them and, they, and demands that they give her quarters for her own laundry because her parents have cut off her money as a consequence for yelling at them on the phone. For emphasis, she, she shakes her tip bucket from the pedestal slash DJ booth from which she reigns, then segues into one of her favorite themes, her parents. Her parents are good, long-suffering people, she tells the assembled twinks, and these good, long-suffering people still support her at age 29 because she is a spoiled brat who has never had a job. A weekly show at a queer dive bar doesn't count, which is an embarrassment to her. And what does she do to repay her parents for their generosity? She spits the words into the mic so acerbically that it pops with her consonants, then pauses a second before answering her own question in a mock outraged oration. She changed her gender just to stymie and confuse them. And now she yells at them on the phone and hangs up on them if they misgender her. That's what they get for supporting a child with artistic tendencies. But what else did they expect? Do they think they could just let their child wear capri pants and there would be no consequences? And do you know the worst part, Talia demands of her twinks? The worst part is that most parents get to one day have a moment of comeuppance when their kids become parents. And then those kids reassess their own childhood with the parents' eyes and regretfully admit that dad knew best all along. And mommy was so generous, so kind, and also beautiful and young. But not my parents, Talia concludes with a cackle, because with all the hormones, now I'm sterile. I stole that comeuppance from them. The cute boys on cutoff shorts lined up along the bar laugh. Talia, Talia theatrically narrows her eyes at them. What are you all laughing at? If you're here listening to me, she admonishes, it probably means you're also a disappointment to your parents. If you like my shtick and you didn't just wander off the street, there's a high probability that you are also a degenerate who will never give your parents a grandchild. Talia spits out her gum in a peek, then continues on to the next question unabated. Talia had given Reese a drink ticket and Reese laughs happily along with the rents, sipping on the free, sipping on the free Corona. Reese sort of loves Talia's parents, or at least Talia's version of them. She empathizes with them. They make all the classic parents of a trans mistakes, but unlike Reese's own parents, they seem to truly and deeply love their child, as baffling and confusing as they find her. Reese can relate. Talia is deeply lovable and talented and spoiled and capable of inexplicable rage, which makes her one of the most compelling girls Reese knows. Talia also happens to be one of the most talented musicians in the city, though she prima donnishly refuses almost all offers to perform. Her parents' largesse allows her to avoid the grind of petty performances, which lesser musicians accept primarily in order to eat and secondarily to build up a following. Still, although Talia performs only rarely, half of her twink followers are fans of her music who settle for seeing her yell at them in a dive bar because it's the closest thing available to hearing her sing. Talia's ta talents only explain a part of Reese's deep affection for her. Reese knows a lot of talented people. Half the trans women in Brooklyn live in a state of perpetual pre-celebrity, awaiting a well-deserved recognition that will never come. No, more than simply finding Talia compelling, Reese secretly and proudly thinks of Talia as her trans daughter. Reese shares this with almost no one because she'd be mortified to take public credit for how remarkably level Talia has turned out to be, even though in her own mind, she deserves a healthy share of that credit. Reese met Talia in the first months of Talia's transition. 
just as Tali entered the full bloom of the second puberty, just as the changes in her body began to show, just as every evening the momentous pendulum of estrogenetic moods swung to despair, just as Talia broke into the period of transition when she cried at the moon and broke mirrors in self-loathing and fell in love, real and present love for the first time. How many nights had Reese sat down with Talia to offer her counsel, both stern and loving, as Talia writhed like a turtle who'd lost its shell, its soft, unarmored flesh abraded by the newly felt humiliations of life as a transsexual? How many times had Reese gone over to Talia's apartment and held her when she cried and tried to give her advice without telling her how to act or patronizing her or creating a hierarchy in their friendship? Because as much as Reese wanted to shake Talia and tell her to grow the fuck up, she admired Talia and all the skills and dreams that she harbored, those same dreams and hopes that Reese herself had given up. Isn't that the most motherly thing of all, to hope your daughter has the chances that you never gave yourself or that you were never given? <clears throat> Mother-daughter mother relationships among drag queens or gay men have a long lineage as a New York City phenomenon, as every queer to have reverently watched Paris as burning will gladly inform you. Reese knows the mother role still holds sway as with still hold sway with the Black and Latina girls adjacent to the ballroom, girls whose families reject them young and early, who need guidance and love and firm talking to's on occasion. That's not how it is with the white girls Reese knows, though. Those girls, unlike the teenagers seeking family in the ballroom scene, often, often haven't yet lost their sense of entitlement and won't stand to be told what to do, won't accept an explicit hierarchy of mother-daughter, especially not from some tranny, only slightly their elder, whose own mistakes layer and squish on each other like a melting cake. Reese has raised a few trans daughters. Excuse me, I'm a little sick right now. Just a cold though, don't worry. Um, Reese has raised a few trans daughters over the years all, and all of the mothering has been tacit. The girls need it, yearn for it, but won't accept it if they realize what it is. And Reese, for as much as she complained about these ungrateful girls, needed them too, craved the chance to nurture someone, to care and soothe them with her softest, most selfless love. Talia sways on her DJ pedestal, a little dance that both mocks and gives in to the chill, cheesy chill of the vaporwave song she's just put on. All Reese's children, and here she is, still alone. How can Reese not feel kinship with Talia's parents? These nice middle-class people, he a doctor and she a teacher, who ache with worry for their daughter and who have no idea Reese exists, who can't know that there is a shadow mother plodding and worrying alongside them. She wants to hug Talia's parents, to tell them it will be okay. Suddenly Reese has to get out of the bar. She has the awful fear that she might, grabbing her purse, she slips out. No one notices. Behind her, Talia, charismatic as always, tosses back at the audience the slips of paper on which they have written their questions, then slides up the volume on another breezy dubstep mix in a show of huffiness that may or may not all be part of the act. On the sidewalk outside the bar, Reese attempts to bum a cigarette from a handsome guy who looks to her like a slightly femme Vin Diesel, but who doesn't register her until she speaks directly to him because he's fixated on two slim boys leaning against each other in the doorway. Distracted, he gives her a cigarette, and then coming to himself, Chivalry recently lights it for her. That's my daughter in there, Reese tells Fen Vin Diesel. He peers through the darkened windows of Talia, then back at Reese. You must be very proud, he says gamely. The two slim boys move back inside, and Fen Vin Diesel glances at them with an expression of loss, unsure how he has committed himself to a supporting role in some transsexual neurotic mother role play. Go with your friends, Reese tells him. She angles a stream of smoke out the side of her mouth and waves the cigarette cherry in the direction where they slipped away. He nods gratefully and steps lightly after them. A few moments later, Talia comes out. Oh my God, I had to escape the baby transes in there. One of them was complaining about how a cis woman looked at her today. That's how wounded she is. She can't take being looked at. Two eyes appraising her is trauma. I can't take it. <clears throat> Such is the explosion of girls transitioning in and around the Brooklyn drag world, and so devoid of those, the, those so devoid are those these girls of their own trans history that Talia, having been on hormones not quite two years, has found herself forcibly placed in a maternal role. Her tone evinces a teenage mother's exasperation with children, having just been one herself. Without asking, Talia takes a cigarette from with, from between Reese's fingers and puffs hard. 
Reese laughs. This is the moment. <clears throat> what is the moment? The moment you just said your mother would never get when a daughter finally has kids of her own and begins to understand that her mother knew best all along. Talia exhales and hands a cigarette back to Reese, who declines it. Don't be so smug about it, Talia says. Maternal smugness is very annoying. Remind me to tell that to my mother next time I call her. She lifts the sole of her shoe behind her, twists herself with easy balance to stub out the, the cigarette on it and flicks the filter into the gutter. Her lashes curve luxuriously around her eyes even when she doesn't wear mascara. And tonight she's worn the mascara thickly, making the amber irises appear bright and unearthly by contrast, illuminated as they are by the orange lights of the sodium vapor street lights. Many people think a trans woman's deepest desire is to live in her true gender, but actually it is to always stand in good lighting. Normally, that means avoiding the unflattering orangey glare of streetlights. Yet Talia, with her dark curls and smooth skin, stands resplendent as a, as a Greek pop star in the fiery hues. <clears throat> in Reese's memory of, memories of childhood, night had a different blue-black tone than in her adult life. And in fact, she later learned when she returned to visit Madison after a long hiatus, this change in the color of night was not an illusion of time and remembrance, but a historical fact. Like most American cities, Madison, Wisconsin had replaced the blue white lighting of incandescent and mercury vapor street lamps with the orange of sodium vapor. This not only required less energy to run, but, but because a trick of the human eye perceives orange light to be brighter and thus more revealing than the same lumens of white blue light, cities installed sodium vapor in the super predator panic 90s as a method to deter street crime. As though one would comfortably rape and murder and steal in the privacy of blue light, but would hew to a life of church going in clean language if illuminated by the eerie public gaze of yellow orange sodium vapor light lamps. In the pictures of Reese's early childhood, cities shone as stars, but now they burned a combustion orange glow heavenward, flames licking the firmament as whole cities engulfed themselves in nocturnal conflagra conflagration, eternally incinerating, blazing, scorching, everybody caught within their scaffolds of kindling. And at the daughter, at the center, her daughter, Talia, queen of fire, <clears throat> I think I need my shot, Reese tells Talia. I'm feeling very grandiose and morose and old. That's always a sign I'm hormonal. I was thinking that the night is a different color than it used to be. I have to change songs, Talia says, taking Reese lightly by the arm. Stop being weird and come back inside. And this, Reese reflects, is the other reason to be a mother in whatever fashion motherhood comes your way. So when you're old and alone and feeling sorry for yourself, your daughter will roll her eyes at your theatrics and bring you in from the cold. So that section. Um, I've got something that's like, that I actually wrote uh, this weekend. Um, so it's pretty fresh. It's, uh, I don't know, it's a couple pages. Maybe I'll just read it, go ahead and read it. I think there's time. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, to explain this, I got asked by Bon Appetit, I just said that's so American, Bon Appetit magazine <laughs> uh, uh, to do a, a piece on a dinner. They have a series that's like a dinner that was a, a, an important dinner in your life. And then they recreate the recipe for that dinner as, as the series. Um, but uh, so this one is, mine was, mine is fried fish. And this, this little section, it may turn out to be quite different in the magazine. They may want a lot more food and a lot less of me, but um, uh, here it is in this version. Uh, so I'm glad for a chance to share it before it becomes a Condé Nast thing. <clears throat> uh, okay, la last Supper. My last dinner as a husband and arguably as a man was fried tilapia. The fish had been caught from a skiff on the shore of Lake Victoria, and only an hour or two later, dredged in flour, fried to a golden crisp in a vat of vegetable oil over a wood fire, and served to me with lime and piri piri. I could still taste the, the green flavor of algae and the flaky white flesh. My senses all registered that, that I had before me a truly excellent meal, but I ate it glumly across from my then wife, Olive, who picked silently at a matching fish. We sat on plastic chairs at a wooden table banged together with pegs. It was the rainy season. 
Low skies reflected in the puddles that pooled in the ruts of red dirt roads that led up to the shore. Huge marabou storks, known as the undertaker bird on account of their ha haunted movements, leprous pink skin and dark wings that hung like a cloak, slipped and flapped through the grasses around us, contributing to the funeral mood. Olive and I had lived in Kampala for almost a year at that point. She was a graduate student and had received a National Science Foundation grant to write an ethnography of Uganda's only lesbian bar. From appearances, a lesbian bar was an odd choice of study for an American woman in a heterosexual marriage, but it had happened organically. Three years before, I had come out to Olive as transgender, but I told her, or rather I told myself and by extension her, that I'd never transition. I just had certain urges and I loved her and I didn't wanna mess up our relationship by transitioning. I, I assured her that I could manage as a man just fine. Olive was in a pre PhD program at the time I came out to her. She had previously worked at an NGO that provided services to teen mothers in Cameroon. That summer, she traveled to Uganda to pick up with her work but newly curious about trans people, she ended up meeting and befriending members of a nascent trans movement in Kampala. The following year, 2008, urged on by members of the American evangelical movement, the Ugandan government outlawed homosexuality, making no distinction between homosexuality and trans identities. The proposed punishment for homosexuality was imprisonment on the first offense, death on the second. And yet, in the midst of this, a group of trans men and lesbians kept open a lesbian bar, more than kept it up, more than kept it open. They kept it packed every night of the week, no matter harassment, police raids, and daily hateful screeds in the Kampala tabloids. When Olive went back and visited her friends under the shadow of the anti-homosexuality bill, they came up with an idea. She would write a year-long ethnography of the bar and its patrons. The next year, that project was funded by the National Science Foundation, and as her husband and a nominal trans person, I went with her. In the United States, I had been experimenting with my gender presentation, pierced ears, eyeliner, tighter shirts. I'd watch RuPaul and be inspired to try out a full drag look, which led to a desperate euphoria for days after, a wild-eyed happiness that I've since encountered in other trans people and understand can be both annoying and alarming. I reasoned that it worked like an escape valve. Give me a day of gender obsession every few months and I could be a good husband the rest of the time. I put my gender on hold in Uganda. In truth, because I'm white and American, it's not like I was risking arrest or the death penalty like queer Ugandans. Two Ugandan trans women I knew while I was there had both been arrested multiple times. What they suffered in an Idi Amin era bunker isn't mine to recount, suffice to say, the only reasons police bring people to Amin era bunkers are horrific. And yet those two persisted in expressing their womanhood. By contrast, I couldn't even be honest with my wife about my own gender. I might've been ashamed of my relative bravery as compared to those two women, but that's the whole point of repression, to remain unconscious of one's own cowardice. In high school, my friend's dad caught him smoking and did that legendary dad thing where he then made my friend smoke an entire pack of Marlboro Reds. My time in Uganda was the masculinity equivalent of smoking an entire pack of cigarettes. I bought a four by four truck and drove it around dusty roads. Hot water was unreliable, so I grew constant stubble. Because people told me t-shirts were disrespectful and slovenly, I took to wearing button down shirts and ties. I learned a few phrases of Luganda, but generally I couldn't follow conversations. So I came to speak even English in a terse clipped manner to avoid letting my confusion or helplessness show. It was effective. I made friends easily. People thought I was competent, but the more I leaned into that masculinity, the more opaque I became to myself. My internal landscape desaturated. Sussing my own emotions was like feeling for lost objects on the bottom of a murky pond. Affection withered before I could express it. I stopped touching Olive, couldn't express any kind of sexual desire. At night, I would catch her watching me, the brief gleam of her sad eyes in the dark as she contemplated why this man she married no longer wanted her. Rather than face those eyes, I'd roll over and away. In the morning, neither of us could manage to talk about it. All day long, she spoke with queer activists, conversations dripping in sex. Everyone wanted to tell the American ethnographer of the furtive illicit hookups made hotter by danger, 
of the dish-breaking drama of breakups and cheating, of clothing and bodies pressed close to late night beats, of slipping away to finger your crush in the back of a broke down 80s Corolla imported from Dubai. Olive and I would laugh along and perform that same open exuberance, but alone under the mosquito net in our rented room, the unsaid words accreted in our mouths like plaque. By winter of that year, 2010, it became clear that a proxy culture war was being waged by the West in Uganda. The religious right, especially the Americans, were losing the battle of gay marriage at home, so turned to the global South in search of new fronts. <clears throat> they lit on Uganda, a country with policies unusually open to foreign organizations. LGBT and human rights organizations were slow to catch up. By 2010, money from US churches was pouring into the accounts of right-wing politicians and European NGOs were funding counteractions. The atmosphere grew, grew increasingly hostile. Allah's friends found their pictures printed daily in Kampala tabloids, along with unfounded accusations of recruiting children into homosexual orgies funded by decadent Europeans. I awoke one morning to Olive crying. A friend of hers, David Coteau, had been killed with a hammer overnight. By evening, Hillary Clinton had weighed in. By the following day, Barack Obama. Right-wing politicians saw this as, as a foreign intervention in Ugandan affairs. They hailed as a hero, Kato's killer, who turned out to be a co confused teenager looking for the foreign cash the gays were rumored to be getting. Olive spent a month helping out during the funeral and its aftermath, a turn into fear and paranoia that swept over Uganda's queer and trans activists, the, hunt, the sudden hunt for asylum applications, safe houses, European sponsors. While she worked, I stayed home, read novels, failed to write my own novels, worried about my truck and occasionally drove it out to the countryside. I bought enough 3G, 3G internet credit to browse extremely slowly, far away trans internet sites on my third generation iPhone. Olive and I went days without seeing each other. It was during this era that Olive and I sat down to a dinner of fried fish at a place we'd been a few times before, a grassy field that ran into a muddy shore north of Gaba Beach. On the weekends, people rented the fields for weddings and events, but on weeknights, a group of women brought tilapia and lake perch to fry in open vats for passerby picnicking on the grass. Because of the intermittent rain, we were the only customers. Tilapia is a maligned fish, the kind of freezer-bitten bland white fish that ends up breaded in tacos. But fresh from the water of their native lake, they rival red snapper for flavor. And I wanted to eat something worthy of a last meal because I knew something Olive didn't. I was leaving. Maybe I wanted to, her to plead with me to stay, but she didn't. She just asked me if I would please sell the truck because she didn't want to deal with it. I gazed out at Lake Victoria. A few men were casting nuts, nets from a skiff onto an algae bloom offshore. The evening was so, so still that the sound of their grunts carried over the water. When you finish here, I asked, will you come home to me? She didn't respond. After a while, she picked off the tail fin of her fish, sucked at it, and threw the bones to one of the marabou storks that peered at us from a dead tree. It did a macabre dance of delight, opened its cloak, and descended upon us. Thanks. Wow. Thank you, Tori. Um, sorry, Sarah, did I cut you off? <laughs> No, I was just going to say thank you so much for reading from your novel and also the new work. It's so exciting to hear that new piece and before, it gets, yeah. before it gets edited out. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's like, they're like, they're like, will you tell us about a nice meal? And I'm like, well, let me tell you about a terrible thing that happened. And they're like, this is a glossy magazine. Like, it's, it's for, I don't know. Hey, they asked. They asked. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> They're, they're, I think they were like, this book was funny. Tell, tell us something more funny. <laughs> so, but this is the mood I was in this weekend. So you know what? Well, I, they didn't give me that much time to write. <laughs> Thank you, Tori. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Naomi who has some questions for you. And um, um, Naomi, it's your turn. You're up. Awesome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I was just so excited. Uh, partly because Sarah, I totally agree. Like, how lucky are we to get to hear that passage before it gets um, Condé nastified? So, um, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but uh, yeah, how cool! Thank you, Tori, for sharing that with us. Um, 
Yeah, any it's common so mass employees here? I'm sorry. I'm, thank you so much for hiring. It's incredible, <laughs> incredible opportunity. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there, there, there. Maybe there is one or two in the room. Um, so uh, I'm so excited that you read from. Although truly, you could have read from any section of the transition baby, and I would have been thrilled because I think the whole book is uh, so zippy and and uh, enthralling, just like that section. Um, I thought maybe we should like establish some ground rules in terms of what we're going to give away or not. So okay. do you have a do you have a policy on spoilers? I'm personally a huge fan of spoilers. Like I will often read, <laughs> like there's that line by um, Nabokov that like all reading or the best reading is rereading or something. And I feel like in order to skip having to read it twice, I just read all the spoilers and then it's like reread, you know, and then it's the best. <laughs> so I'm pro spoilers, but I think I'm, I'm uh, I like, yeah, I, I mean, this is just this is a little craft thing. I, I enjoy it because then I, I'm like, oh, how are, I know what the ending is. How are they, get, what's the moves that they're going to use to get to that ending? And somehow that's almost as exciting as whatever the ending is itself. Like I ruined Game of Thrones for myself, like first. <laughs> <clears throat> wow, totally. Well, okay, so then it's been <laughs> spoken. Everyone in this room, spoiler alert, all the spoilers. Um, yeah. Although I do think that one thing about this book is that uh, about Detransition Baby specifically is that I think you could know almost everything that happens in it and you would still be kind of like uh, glued to the page and also shocked in some ways. Like it's interesting the way the book has been talked about is and now we'll just get into the spoilers like it's pretty openly discussed as like um, former partners, one of whom has detransitioned and a third person who is one of their lovers are contemplating parenting a child together are contemplating motherhood together. And that's like a huge part of the book, but we all know that going into it. And um, yeah, it's the first chapter know. in fact. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't give anything away. I just give, give, I put the whole plot in the first chapter so I can just meander for the rest of the time. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So I thought we could start with, um, the dedication, which I know a lot of people have sort of brought up because it's really interesting. And for people who don't, who haven't read it, the dedication to the book is to divorce cis women who, like me, had to face starting their life over without either reinvesting in the illusions from the past or growing bitter about the future. And this line also comes up later in the book, Reese gets it um, when she's talking to Katrina about who she thinks has anything interesting to say about gender, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so I was thinking um, that, you know, in the acknowledgments, you describe the book as a story of trans feminine culture in the new millennium. And I was like, wow, that is exactly what this book feels like it's about to me. Um, and of course it's being read by a lot of people. It is a bestseller, congratulations. And I saw it's being published in Brazil maybe, right? Like it's yeah, being it's read by people be, yeah. everywhere. Um, and probably not all of them are uh, intimately <clears throat> familiar with trans feminine culture, or maybe I would guess that a lot of people reading your book, like, don't even think that they know a trans person. Yeah. So I wonder um, what that's been like for you. You obviously can't speak for those people, but I suspect that you have heard from them. Um, and I would be curious about like, just what it has been like to publish this book that is such a specific story um, about a very specific corner of our culture that is now being read by people far outside of it. Well, I mean, I think it does speak to that dedication. Um, you know, I, when I first started writing, I, <clears throat> well, my first, let me say that differently. When I first started writing sort of trans material, I had this idea that, um, I wanted to write only for trans women. And this is sort of like similar to like uh, what Toni Morrison did with like black women. Like I write explicitly for black women and everyone else can keep up. And what that does, well, I won't speak for Toni Morrison, but what I'll say for, for me writing for a trans audience <clears throat> is it meant that um, I didn't have to slow down to explain anything. So much of what trans writing was before was like 70% story, but 30% explanations. And I was like, if I assume a trans audience, I'm just gonna be able to go at a full out sprint the entire time. The second thing it does is it actually raises the bar. And um, because 
it's oftentimes pretty easy to tell cis people stuff that interests them about being trans. It's pretty difficult to tell trans people stuff, things that are interesting about being trans. Like, you know, I say, if I went to a trans person, I was like, this is how hormones work. They would like yawn at me. They'd be like, yeah, I do it every week for the last like however many years. <clears throat> so it means if I want to talk about hormones, I have to bring a higher level of insight. So that was really my like framework over the last, I don't know, couple years before I started this novel. And then as I was writing this novel, I began to think a little bit less in terms of identity and more in terms of affinity because there's a lot of trans women who don't actually have the same experience of me. They don't share the same culture, which is, you know, very sort of a certain like Brooklyn girl culture. And, and I was like, well, who do I have an affinity with? And I was, at the time I was in my mid thirties and I was like feeling pretty kind of lost. It was like, um, you know, I'd spent a long time partying. I'd been, I'd gotten divorced as in that thing had said, and then I moved to transition, moved to Brooklyn. I was mostly just kind of partying and, and I didn't know what was up and uh, especially how to get older. And uh, I started reading a lot of books by divorced cis women. And I found that the trajectory of a transition and the ways that I transitioned looked a lot like the trajectory of divorce. And that you live your life a certain way, expecting certain things under certain sort of like illusions of like, this is what my life is gonna look like. And then suddenly there's a break and what feels like a failure or a fall or you know, any number of things. Um, and you have to then pick yourself up and you, you know, and I don't mean that the transition's like a fall, but I mean, in terms of being like, I was so wrong about myself. I was so wrong about what I believed my life could, was gonna be and who I was. and I had been living so much in a state of fear and, um, and realizing that's very hard. So then you have to move forward and you have to not get bitter about the time that you invested in that other way of thinking. And you have to not reinvest in those same illusions that brought you to that failure. And so there was like a way of thinking and a way of approaching life that I found in these works by divorced cis women that I was like, wow, actually these books are not just good books. I am learning how to live. I'm learning how to think from these books. And after a long time of reading them, you know, Ferrante or Rachel Kosk or, you know, uh, there's any number, um, <clears throat> I began to feel like, okay, but actually I have some things to say back to them in terms of gender. I, this, this, I want this to be a conversation. These books helped me, but I think there's some places where they're not seeing certain things about gender. So I wanna write this book as an open conversation. And as a result, I think it hasn't, you know, the, the Toni Morrison thing is true. Toni Morrison's read by all sorts of different people. And if you just run and it's exciting to run, people keep up with you. And, and two, so you can be read in Brazil. And if you're, if you're running, people aren't gonna be like, what's this? If they, you know, if they're reading in good faith, they're like, we're going to go for it. And number two, that condition of starting over and of opening a conversation isn't really like geographically or even culturally bounded. I think that that experience is 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 available for a lot of different people, and that the cultural specificity of trans culture works like many other culturally specific things. Like I think a lot, I thought a lot about Philip Roth about how you know, writing whatever one thinks about him as a person, writing about this very, very specific narrow time of, of being like, not just a Jewish American, <clears throat> but like a Jewish American in the 50s in Newark, specifically Newark. And you write about that and it's so narrow that it sort of like goes through the wormhole and becomes universal. And so that when you think about like uh, immigration literature, assimilation literature, all of these things, you can read Philip Roth and it can vibe with Juno Diaz or it can vibe with Junpa Lahiri or it can vibe with any of um, all these things. And, and I think that the, so there's a way in which the specificity of trans feminine culture, rather than being a hindrance is, is 
does that wormhole physics thing that, that writing sometimes does and becomes accessible to people who otherwise wouldn't have picked up this book. That was a long answer, but uh, <laughs> it is how I feel. No, it's a good one. And it opens up so many other threads of conversation. I mean, it, you know, I, I feel like one thing that it makes me think about, and you were talking about, I like running as a word here, because I think it's, it's the right mm -hmm. feeling. Like if you're running and people are into it, they'll keep up with it. And I feel like in some ways, like a, I think a question that writers, any of us who come from identities that are not like broadly represented in the mm -hmm. mainstream are always thinking about is like, how much do I have to explain? And I feel like this book is kind of like the like, kind of definitive proof of like, you don't have to explain actually. Um, uh, and I think it kind of speaks for itself in that way. It's interesting, I, I'm i thinking about, um, so New York Magazine uh, profiled you um, and you said this thing in, in the story that, that I thought was really insightful that I keep thinking about, um, which is that we're coming to a stage of trans literature where cis people come to know themselves through a trans lens and sort of relates to what you're talking about, I think, in that um, partly like, what are, what are people going to take from your book? Um, and like one of the things that I thought was so amazing in Detransition Baby is the revelation that kind of happens. It's not happening for some of the characters, but that's happening for some of the cis characters, like repeatedly that like everybody has a gender um, and yeah. that like gender play is something that everybody does. And there's a, um, there's a great section where uh, one of the um, cis women in Katrina's friend group is like, you know, just like basically getting off on thinking about her husband doing like uh, like mask cosplay upstate for the weekend, yeah. um, like lumberjack cosplay. Yeah. And uh, see if I can pull it up fast enough. You have this, there's this line that, uh, uh, if only cis heterosexuals would realize that like trans women, the activity in which they are indulging is a big self-pleasuring lie that has little to do with their actual personhood. They'd be free to indulge in a whole new flexible suite of hot ways to lie to each other. Um, so yeah, I just think it's like, I, there is this um, way that I hope that people are reading this book and being like, oh wow, I have a gender. And like, I do yeah. like, and I wonder whether you've heard from those people. I especially wonder if you've heard from like cis men um, who are learning that they yeah. have a gender? I mean, I think it's funny. Like, you know, if cis men understood that they had a gender, they'd realize like that they're doing it all the time. Like, and I, my joke about this is like the catching a fish in the Tinder profiles, you know, like, it's like, why do you have a fish in your Tinder profile? Like, <laughs> what are you, what are you communicating there? Are you going to come to a date and like smack a fish on the table in some restaurant and be like, I have caught this for you, woman? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> I am a provider, you know, but actually that is what they're doing, right? They're doing like, I am a provider. I am a hunter. I, you know, in a time of famine, I'm safe, <laughs> you know, and like, and, and that's a gender thing. And it's like, and it's like, it's like, that's cool, that's a good gender. Like maybe not the right time to deploy it. You know, like if you realize you were doing gender, it would be, uh, it would be, that's a good, you know, like that, in fact, that provider hunter thing could be hot in the right circumstances. First impression, maybe not the best. Um, you know, and that's what those, those, those women in the book, their husbands were going upstate and they were, you know, gonna like wear flannel and like pound whiskey and like just be like bros in a cabin. <clears throat> and uh, and they were, and you know, these women were really excited by their by their husband, you know, chopping wood and and stuff. And it's like, but they're like New York white collar men, you know. So they're just like, what, what are they? Who are we kidding? And it's like, you're not doing this because wood needs to be chopped for heat. You're doing this because it's like hot to each other to be woodsmen. And, um, and, uh, and that's a gender, like the gender isn't, isn't man and woman, gender is like fishermen or woodsmen or like, you know, any number of, uh, of, of genders, you know, even within, and I feel like this is something that queers do all the time, like, it'd be like, 
like they're not like oh she's a woman they'll be like she's a high femme or she's a she's like a she's a footch you know or something like that like these like all these different uh variations uh hard femme you know we, that 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 the people say about sometimes call people sporty spice is that the that's sporty. gender <clears throat> that's a gender sporty spice is a is a is a clear and definite gender for people no, always get what you mean going on 30 years you know <laughs> so uh it's um yeah these are all genders and i think that um you know these are these are ways of being when i talk about like i want to talk back to ferrante it's like why did you like nino i don't know whether to put a ending on it and nino whatever uh uh half of what he's doing is just a gender. Like you just like him because he's doing a gender. You know, Ferrante, I could have saved you so much time, <laughs> so much pain. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that, you know, I, I do talk to, I, I do talk to her and I do, I've been surprised actually by, by some of the men who, um, uh, you know, it's sometimes really sweet. My, my sister-in-law has a, um, this boyfriend who's like, you know, like a Dominican dude who does CrossFit and like, you know, um, he's, he, he read it and then he like bought the book for all his bros and it was like really wow. sweet. And he was like, this book, it really changed something for me. And he was like really earnest about it. And I just pictured him like giving it to his friends. Like, it's too bad that they didn't have the pink one in the United States. Yes. Like, giving like a pink book to his friends. Be like, this really changed me. <laughs> like. <laughs> but, um, speaking of gender, uh, it's, so it has happened. I'm kind of rambling now. No, no, no. It's great. I think it's that's amazing. Um, this really changed me. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's my that's my hope for it. Um, yeah, because uh, yeah, and I and I I don't want to let this topic pass without saying that like I thought one of the a corollary to that that is such a Another brilliant moment that happens in the book is that I, I think it's Reese or it might be Amy. I can't remember which of them is is thinking through this, but sort of exploding this idea, this like kind of early anti-trans um, narrative from anti-trans psychologists that like um, if you were that like of autogynephilia and that like if you were yeah. like turned on by being a woman, then that was just a fetish and that didn't yeah. mean then you weren't really trans. And I, again, I can't remember if it's Amy or Reese, but one of them is like literally everybody is like turned on by like our entire sexual culture is built around affirming the gender of the person you're with and them affirming the gender that you are like it's yeah. one giant and like the the you know Reese and Amy are so comfortable with they're so aware of that and like it's so invisible to most of the cis characters in the book um so I just I yeah I just I like yeah. loved that moment of exploding that myth yeah, and I think that that's actually like a lot of um, a lot of you know the, the transphobic stuff is 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 um, thinking that what's what trans women are doing is somehow exceptional when in fact like what trans women are doing is kind of what most women are doing. It's just that it's been so normalized by by cis women that these behaviors become invisible you know and then trans women do it and trans women are are um seen as regressive or you know too hyper feminine or, or any number of things and um and yeah that that's it's funny that that section that section was actually one of the earliest things i wrote because i think it was something that i was like getting through a number of years ago and now it, it doesn't bother me that much like because I, it, I just see it in everybody else so like somebody else being like pointing out you know the glass house that I live in or whatever is is it's it almost doesn't feel worth it to be like you you too you know <laughs> like <laughs> so, uh, uh, um, yeah that's, that's yeah well thank you well, I'm glad we I'm glad we talked about it. I mean, on the sort of flip side of things, like because we've sort of been discussing what the book, I guess, like gives 
this is very reductive of me to say, but like give cis people and thinking about gender. I'm also thinking about all the things it's giving those of us who are not cis. And like, there were so many parts of this book that where I felt like you articulated something that not only had I not seen, that I related to that not only had I not seen articulated anywhere, but that I wasn't even sure I could have put into words myself. Like I'm especially thinking about some of the writing about dissociation related to gender around sex mm -hmm. and like, um, and another passage that's sort of related to what you're saying now about where Reese is talking about how her politics and her own dysphoria don't line up and how she's like, yeah. you know, um, she would happily cheer on, this is a quote, this is not my words. She would happily cheer on any other woman who flaunted her orbital ridge in the name of challenging cis normative beauty standards, but she would have the first available misogynist dick of a surgeon burr her skull, Barbie smooth. Um, so I'm, I'm interested, I guess, like, were those, those moments, like, let's say some of the writing about how you describe dissociation during sex or, or, or writing about dysphoria, like, were those things that you had already thought through and you just knew exactly what you were going to say about them? Or like, you know, Annie Dillard talks about writing as an epistemological tool, which I really love, like that we learn, we write yeah. to understand our own thoughts. And were those sections where you were sort of figuring it out as you were writing it? Some of those sections I had already sort of processed in my head and the work was giving them to Reese. But I will say that oftentimes it was writing those sections of what I thought and the project of writing a novel just takes so long that you write something and you're pretty sure that's what you believe. And then you come back to it two years later and you discover that actually it's wrong or that it's not quite nuanced enough. I mean, <clears throat> One of the examples about dissociation here is that I wrote about dissociation and I wrote about it the first time as a specific sort of circumstance of being, uh, feeling like you were a girl and the world telling you were a boy. And then basically being like, well, in order to be a boy, I'll just sort of leave these feelings that I have and live. And so I'll sort of dissociate from these internal feelings and I'll live in this dissociated state. <clears throat> and the place that that often comes really into uh, sort of a time that you confront it is during sex when you're supposed to be back in your body, you know, but you've your whole way of being is sort of being outside your body. So I thought about that a lot in, ter in trans terms. And then after I wrote that section, about a year later, Cat Person in the New Yorker, you know, that, that famous story that has had many subsequent iteration, you know, iterations or <laughs> codas, I guess you'd say to it, um, was published. And I read that story and I recognized what was happening to the narrator in that story was dissociation, like classic dissociation that I had thought of as like a really trans experience. And basically being like, oh, I'm not so, this, this, is, this, this is almost exactly how I wrote it. And I wrote it as a specifically trans experience, which means that either this narrator is trans and there's no sign of that, or this is a much more universal thing than I uh, had allowed myself to believe and that I'm having, there's actually much more kinship and there's much more shared that I, than, I, than I know. And there's more people who have things to tell me than I would know. And so actually I had to go through it when I, the sections on dissociation, when I had, there was more theory, there was more, this is how this works, I'm so sure. And then to be confronted with the fact that I was wrong, I had to actually erase a lot of my, you know, carefully theorized and typed out, you know, then thinly fictionalized lectures. Um, and, and I think at the end of the book, most of those, those lectures were cut because time usually proves me wrong <laughs> so uh and and that's the beauty of writing a novel instead of a tweet yeah you have some time to, yeah. to process and reprocess things and revise yeah. and what we're left with then is is just i think like a really some really uh vivid and like uh evocative descriptions of the experience of dissociation rather than the idea of it, um, yeah. which I think is really hard to describe since it's fundamentally about not feeling or not being present. Yeah. Um, uh, 
Sarah, I know we're like close on time. Should I, should I, uh, sh can I ask Tori more? Should I? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I've been really enjoying listening in. Um, we have one more minute left and there have been no questions dropped into the chat, even though I, oh, there's one question. <laughs> um, Tori, do you mind entertaining one question? Um, no, no, I, mean, I, I mean, I can go for a, a while. <laughs> Okay. Other people have places to be. Um, um, so, so Juniper was wondering um, <clears throat> what directions are you excited to see trans writing go in? Um, you know, I'm going to say something that's like a little bit, a little bit bitchy. Um, and it's that <laughs> I think that a lot of trans stories thus far have been um, have been well okay I, I'm gonna answer this a little bit longer I know people have to leave but essentially the Joanna Russ has this idea about women's writing and then other that it got taken towards other marginalized groups that there's various stages of of literature the first stage is a sort of like um we're just like you kind of stage like hey here we are we're just like you dominant culture the second stage is we're nothing like you like fuck you, we, we reject you, and we're, the, we're the diametrically opposed to you. The third stage is sort of like, we have nothing to do with you one way or another. We do not define ourselves either against you or with you, it, but uh, we're just separate. And then I think that's Joanna Russ's schema. I think there's a fourth stage, which speaks to the sort of trans lens and affecting everything, which is that I think the dominant culture then begins to pick up the ideas of the minority culture. So you have suddenly straight people who can only see themselves through the through queer terms or through the sex, they can only talk about their sexuality through queer terms. Um, you have, you know, white people who can only understand their race through uh, work done by scholars of color or black scholars. And now what we're getting to in, in, in trans literature is you're getting to a stage in which cis people can under, mostly understand their gender through terms that are thought up by trans people. And you see this in Maggie, like, you know, probably most prominently in Maggie, Not, Maggie Nelson's Argonauts um, and there's a strain of books along this thing. And so what's been a little frustrating to me is <clears throat> that I think trans people, when when we're writing, we're still occasionally writing in that third in that third space while this fourth stage space is happening, and so there's a sort of YA aspect to trans writing, which is like, what does it you know? How are my parents going to accept me? Am I going to get a a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Am I going to get what's my identity? And these are actually things that you often see in YA books. I'm interested in seeing trans people respond to this fourth level, which is that transness is now in the dom is the dominant culture has picked up transness. It's using it in all these different ways. And um, and a lot of the insular fights that we're having about what what does it mean? Are you what does it mean to be non-binary? What is it you know X Y Z? How are these? What are the lines of demarcation between them? I'm like that's we're squabbling amongst ourselves, and the world is going by. Let's intervene in it. Let's push it. Let's shape it. Let's do all this stuff. And I think that there are books being published that are doing that. Um, I talk about Jackie S. Um, her book, Daryl, which is about a white cuckold and, uh, and the adventures of a white cuckold in, uh, in, in Oregon. Jackie's a, a mixed race trans woman. And um, she's applying this, a trans lens to a white character, to a white cis male character. And she's shaping the, the way that you see things. I think there's all sorts of um, all sorts of ways, and I can't imagine them myself because I'm only myself as a writer. But I think there's all sorts of interventions that trans people are going to make that are 
in, that are going to shape the movement of culture beyond just how it affects us. And, um, and I think we have the capacity to do that. And I'm excited for that movement. I think that the questions of, you know, what does this mean for ourselves? I certainly spent a number of years there, um, but I'm curious about what, what happens when the borders dissolve as, as dominant culture takes these ideas. Um, I think we can do one more question, Tori. Um, and that's actually sort of a good note to transition into it, which is um, in terms of thinking about where writing is going, you have uh, two of your <clears throat> books are being revised and coming out again next year, right? Um, yeah. So can you tell us about them and yeah. Sure. I have a, so I had two novellas that I self published because at the time I was writing, I was part of this trans scene and a lot of the publishing houses didn't really know what to do with a lot of our writing. So we, and for various reasons, I decided that I wanted to just self publish and give them directly to trans girls on the internet or trans women. I gave them away for free and they sort of became these like cult novellas um, before I published with a big press. And uh, most of my audience was, came from this self-publishing thing rather than, even though I, I had an MFA, I think that self-publishing actually helped me much more than any of the MFA connections. Um, and so, but what happened is now that I publish, places are like, well, what else have you got? And it takes me, this one, this novel took me five years. Um, and so I don't have anything more right now, but I, I do have these two novellas. And then I had an, a, a, a third one that was about half done and I rewrote most of it. And then now I'm working on a fourth. And so we're gonna publish, it's, it's due at Christmas. We're gonna publish these four novellas as a collection. And then hopefully I'll turn my attention to this completely to this um, novel that I've started. And that uh, I think, you know, when you publish a book, it's a, a bit of a gauntlet and it's hard to, hard to sort of find equilibrium afterwards when you have a sort of onslaught of people's opinions uh, about your writing to then basically be like, no, wait, what do I actually think? And what do I actually care about? And um, I'm finding my footing. Um, like everybody said my sentences were too complicated. So I started writing these really simple sentences and I was like, that's not actually, that's not my style. Like what, what am I doing? Why Goodreads write, like, Goodreads reviewer, like number 27 that just don't read it, you know? Like, so, um, <laughs> God. so that's the stage I'm in right now. Can you tell us anything about that new novel or maybe sure. you should maybe? No, I'm happy to. As I said, I love a spoiler, a spoiler for a book that hasn't even been written yet. Um, uh, it's, um, it's about, it's, it's what I'm calling a queer financial thriller. And it's because I think that in queerness, um, money's, money and identity and how money gets, money and identity, there's a confluence in the ways that they sometimes are talked about that, that I think within the queer community, we don't wanna talk about. Um, and so I want to talk about it because I think it, especially as somebody who like, you know, in the last year has come into more access, it's, I've been trying to make sense of it. And, um, and, uh, and so I was like, I like genre stuff. I like the way genre things will offer things. And I was like, you know, I really like like the big short. I love like these financial thrillers, you know? And I was like, and, and you never expect to see a queer in like the big short being like, buy, sell, I've got a scheme, you know? And uh, so I was like, I don't know, I don't know, I want to get some shady queers uh, doing some financial <laughs> dirty dealings and uh, see how that goes. Sounds amazing. I cannot wait to yeah. read it. Thank you so much, Tori. Thank you for a lovely, thank you for these amazing questions and, and like the space to just kind of riff. This was, this was a, a, a huge pleasure. And 
Thank you, everybody. Who, I mean, I can see on the screens. I love that everyone has their cameras on. Usually I do this. It's like me just talking to like a bunch of, you know, boxes and names. And I, I love, uh, for people who don't have their cameras on, I apologize. But, <laughs> uh, you know, there's a lot of people with their cameras on. And so uh, um, it's, it's lovely to see all your faces. Thanks for coming out. Thank you so much, Tori. Thank you, Naomi. Um, and it was the highlight of my week. Um, and it's been a pleasure. And there's some, you know, blowing up in the chat right now. Um, I can't wait for your, your, your collected novellas and your new novel forthcoming. Um, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to search for that Condé Nast article when it gets yeah. published. <laughs> yeah, well, just to be like, you got the, you got the director's cut. So. Yeah, we, I'm going to be like, oh, no, no, they shouldn't have edited that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Right. Have a Thank great you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Naomi, so much for facilitating this. I, I can't wait to have a chance to talk to you more sometime. Yeah, me too. Thank you, Tori. Bye, Bye guys. Everyone.